Hello Booktube, my name is Elizabeth. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, Bookgasm Books. This is a recent reads video. This is the sort of video where I just chit chat about the books that I've read recently. Um, I, I think it will also be a good time to sort of uh, revise my plans for March because I, 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 it's not going well. <laughs> At the beginning of March, I had lofty plans. I wanted to participate in so many events. And now that the month is half over, I know that it's not going to happen. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come back on that. So let's start with the things that are going well. Um, I finished my books for the BookTube Prize, so that's done. Um, I still have to vote, though I haven't uh, written my vote in. Uh, but I'm going to do that right after I finish this video because I have to, it's time. Uh, so that, that's two books read. And then I've read three books for March Mystery Madness. So that's, that's the other event that is going really well. So I'm going to start with that. So uh, the first book that I read for March Mystery Madness was A Quiet Place by Seicho Matsumoto. Uh, this is a book set in Japan, in post-World War II Japan, modern Japan. Uh, this is the story of a man who is away on a business trip. He receives a call saying that his wife is dead. Um, she died of natural causes. She had a heart attack. She had a heart condition. So it's not that surprising, even though she was young. Uh, but it's not that surprising. What is surprising is the place where she died. She died in a store in a corner of Tokyo where she had no reason to be. So uh, the husband, if, even though he's grieving, he, he's asking questions. He's wondering, what was she doing there? She had no business there. And then he realized that at the top of the hill of the, the, the place where she, she died, she died, uh, the, the wife died in a store. So at the top of the hill of the street where the, street, the, the store was, there are couples hotels. So it's basically a place where couples go to have affairs. So he starts asking questions and discovers things about his wife. And after that, things happen. I don't want to spoil the book, but after that, things happen. And then it becomes not so much a mystery as a bit of a psychological thriller, because you wonder, because the things happen on the page. Uh, so th there's no mystery there. We know everything, but the question becomes, will the person get away with it? Will will things remain okay, or will they go for the worse? And it, it's very interesting. It's um, I really like that book. Uh, it's, if you've never read Matsumoto, I recommend him. He's really good. The second mystery that I read, it's in French, but it's probably a name that you know, it's Maigret. Uh, so the, Maigret is the name of the sleuth. Uh, the author is Sino. So this is a big book that I borrowed from the library. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, books, nine novels of Maigret in that book, um, in that tome. I have not read the nine, I've read just the first. Um, I think the title in English, I forgot to check it, is uh, Maigret's Little Joke. I think that's the title. So basically, it's the story of uh, the Commissaire Maigret, the, the, um, the inspector. Uh, he's on holiday uh, and he's with his wife. And um, however, they had so much problems the last time they went on holiday, they decided to stay in Paris. But to be very discreet, to tell people that they are not in Paris. I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm not receiving anyone. And they decide to say that they are away even though they are in Paris. And then a murder happens. Uh, but Maigret doesn't want, doesn't want to get involved. But so, at the same time, he can't help but get involved. But he's away on travel, he's away, so he's not going to the um, commissariat, he's not going to the uh, police station. He's, he's trying to solve the murder through newspaper articles. So uh, there's not a lot of sleuthing going on. That's what the two, my first two March Mystery Madness books had in common. There was not a lot of sleuthing going on, not a lot of questions being asked, not a lot of clues being gathered, being put together. Um, and the fact that Maigret does not question anyone in this book sort of shows that his technique is not so much about finding clues and finding, uh, trying to find the logic and the um, yeah the, the clues, the proof that somebody is guilty. It, it goes very much in the mind. He interprets the personality of the people involved and tries to figure out who had a motive. It, it, it works much more with motive than with, um, with proof. Um, and it shows a side of uh, investigating that is quite different from the traditional English-American tradition. The French tradition of investigating is much more psychological. Um, I I've watched quite a few true crime shows in France, from France, about um, murders being committed in France and the trials set in France. And just the standard of proof already is entirely different. So in the British tradition, so it's in the UK, in Canada, in the United States, for a person to be convicted, you the jury has to be convinced beyond reasonable doubt. 
So reasonable doubt, it, it has to do with reason. Is there a reason to doubt that the person committed the crime? If there's a reason to doubt, you acquit and that's that. In France, it's worded differently. The words are conviction intime. Uh, so it's sort of, the best way to translate it means deep down you're convinced. It has nothing to do with reason. It's just deep down you're convinced. It has, it's an entirely different way of going about the thing. And anyway, so I was just thinking about that when I was reading this uh, Maigret, uh, that they think about crime in France in a way that is very different than we do in the British tradition of um, police and justice and all of that. And the last book that I read for March Mystery Madness is this one. It's not the entire thing. This is an omnibus again. There are three, uh, three volumes, three novels in there. I had already read the first two, so I read the third one, which is Dead Man's Ransom by Ellis Peters, and it features Brother Catfell as the sleuth. Um, in this one, there's actually more questioning than in the other two, even though the other two are set in contemporary times where the police has much more means, at, at least fingerprints and all of that. There's no fingerprints. No, I, yeah, fingerprints, there were, there, there was, uh, the science was a bit um, involved in the first one in, um, in A Quiet Place. There was a question of fingerprints. Uh, but in this one, they have very little to go on because it is set in the 12th century in the Middle Ages during a civil war. Um, so it's, it's, however, uh, the author manages to find clues. Well, the, the um, it's not the author. The author creates a story where there are clues scientific clues uh, that can be detectable by somebody from the Middle Ages. And it makes for a very interesting story. I'm just very slow paced. The murder happens at page about 60 of the book. Um, and at first it, it sounds more like a romance than like a mystery, but I don't mind that. I really like the pace of these books. They are very cozy uh, in their atmosphere and in, their, in the setting. Uh, even though it's set in the Middle Ages in the middle of a civil war, there's not that much blood. Uh, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's nice. I like it. And this was the last Brother Cat file that I had on my shelves in reserve because a couple of years ago I went to a used bookstore and I bought two of these books. So I bought uh, the second volume and the third volume of the Omnibus. So this is the third Cat file Omnibus. So I had six books that I could read and I've read them slowly and this one was the last one. So I'm out of Brother Cat files on my shelves. I still have access to them at the library and on screen and I still can find some others but there are no more just ready to be grabbed. So that's the first three books that I read. Well, it's not the first three. It's um, the, um, the three books that I read for March Mystery Madness. So my other projects for uh, March, I wanted to read uh, The Book of Disquiet with the Classics and Company Book Club. I started it. I was about halfway through. And then uh, my loan from the library was expired. I had to renew it except that I could not renew it because somebody else had put a hold on the book and was waiting for it. So I had to bring the book back to the library and I figured, well, I'll just continue with the English version that is on script. The problem with the Book of Disquiet is that it is not a linear book. And it, it, it was the uh, object of a lot of discussion in the Discord group. Uh, what version do you have? How are the fragments organized? Because it's a book made of fragments. Um, Pessoa wrote this on little bits of papers here and there, and they were gathered after his death by a friend of his. So the organization is not, it, it's not fixed. The, the, the little scraps of paper, they were not numbered. So there, there's no official version, in a way, of the Book of Disquiet. And my book in French was 260 pages long, and there were, if I remember correctly, 157 fragments, something like that. And in the original Portuguese, there were 520 fragments. So when I picked up the English version on script, there was just no way that I could start where I had left off because the fragments were in an entirely different order and some of them were just not there. And um, I was a bit discouraged and I've decided not to continue reading the book. It was interesting. I'm glad I read the first, uh, I read about a hundred pages, a bit more, of the book that I had borrowed from the library, of the version that I had borrowed from the library. So I read about a hundred pages, 
here and there. <laughs> in other versions, it's like 100 pages from fragments here and there of the Book of Disquiet. Um, it gives me an idea of what it is. Uh, but I, I, I will not read. I will not start over from the beginning in English and read it. The, um, uh, the the English version I think had is closer to four hundred pages. So I, I, I don't think I want to read four hundred pages of the Book of Disquiet, uh, knowing that there will be a hundred pages that I've already read. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's that. <laughs> that's that. Uh, the other thing that had I had to change my plans. Um, I said I wanted to participate in March of the Mammoth. And uh, with M&M's, I chose this mammoth. However, I had to put it aside because I received a book from the library. I had put a loan on a book and that's another mammoth. That is 800 pages long, like 803 if we include the index, if just the text, the text and the pictures. It is just the most gorgeous book. Um, if I open without looking, will I open with the picture? Yay! <laughs> a picture! Okay, no picture. No picture. It's full of pictures. Um, it, it's, it's just... Let's go like this. So, it's very heavy. Um, the pages, it's all glossy paper. It's, um, it's, uh, I should give you the title. It's the reopening of the Western mind, the resurgence of intellectual life from the end of antiquity to the dawn of the enlightenment by Charles Freeman. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a, a bit of history of thinking, uh, starting from the end of the, uh, of antiquity and going all the way to the beginning of the enlightenment. I've just said that. Uh, so I've already started reading it. I am at page, uh, 72 at the moment. Um, if I read about 50 pages a day, I will finish it, uh, before the end of March. Uh, for March of the Mammoth, you don't have to finish your book, but because this is a library book and I don't know if someone else is waiting for it, there's a good chance it's a brand new release. So there's a good chance that somebody else is waiting for it so if I want to finish it um, I have three weeks to read it so 50 pages a day and I should be good um, to finish it um, yeah it's uh, so far it's very good I really I really like it and then uh, the other things I wanted to participate in were perhaps the Irish readathon, perhaps Dewey Thon, which is a readathon about uh, Welsh uh, literature, and perhaps her storyathon. Well, in fact, I said I wanted to participate in her storyathon. Um, and so far, I've done nothing for these readathons. Uh, but I've read something else. That's the thing. I said I want to participate in these events, and then I end up wanting to read something else. And I, I just read other things. So these are the other things that I've read. Oh, so that's one of the other things that I've read. Um, I, I was very, um, I checked for the title in English and the title in English, it was published with a Fitzcarraldo. So that's why the cover is not, um, <laughs> the, the cover is not very um, illustrated. So it's The Fallen by uh, Carlos Manuel Alvarez. So in French, it's Tombé. And um, it's the story of a family in Cuba. Uh, we are in the early 2000. Uh, the date is not the, the date is not really uh, mentioned. However, we know um, from the age the children were during the 1990s and the age that they are now that we are no later than 2010. So probably around 2007, 8, something like that. Uh, so we follow uh, the characters of the family, uh, the father, the mother, the daughter, the son. Um, and for it's the book, even though it's very short, it's divided in five parts and the five parts are divided into four parts. So we have for each part the point of view of the son, the mother, the father, the daughter in that order. Uh, so the son is starting his military servant, uh, servant service, his military service. Um, he hates it. Um, and uh, he's somebody who is very bright, very intelligent, and he's signed up for university, so his military service will be just one year. Uh, the mother, she used to be a teacher, and now she has a disease. She has these, um, uh, these seizures, and she falls everywhere, and she's not doing well at all. The father works in tourism. He's the manager of a hotel. Uh, he is a very ardent and convinced communist. He believes in the party. He believes in the store, in the, in the story. He, he believes in the ideals of communism and he, he's a true believer. And uh, the daughter is the pragmatist of them all. Um, she, she, she used to go to university, but she decided to go work in tourism because that is where you can not necessarily make money, but that is where 
where you can get access to stuff that is difficult to access in Cuba, including food. Um, and um, yeah, she, she's a bit the pragmatist in the middle of all that. And each character is very interesting. Um, yeah, it made me so, sort of a little travel, little trip in Cuba. So it was good. And uh, finally, the last book that I've read, I've actually finished it just before, uh, just this afternoon before I started filming this. Uh, it is The Magnificent Match by Gail Buck. Uh, this is a, um, a Regency novel um, and it's a romance. It's a Regency romance. I should have said that. Um, I saw the title um, on uh, one of Steve Donahue's uh, library tours. Uh, he's at the moment in the romance bookcase and I'm having a lot of fun watching these videos because uh, he's naming a lot of authors' names that I don't know. So uh, while I watch the video on my phone, I go on my iPad and I check the Scribd app that I have and I just look for the author's names and then whenever the author is there, I put one book on my TBR list. And in the many books that he had, he had a book by um, Gail Buck. So um, I googled, uh, not googled, but in script, I searched for Gail Buck and it was dozens of books. There are plenty of them. So I just looked for one. I had paused the video and I was looking for one that interested me and I decided that it was this one that would interest me. So uh, I pushed on my list and then I pressed play again and then Steve continued his library tour and then another Gail Buck came up and he talked about that specific one. And uh, his cover is different from this one. So on his cover, the man is wearing um, a suit that, that sort of looks like regimental suit. So he, he wondered, uh, is it about, uh, it, would it be that the love interest is not a member of the landed gentry? And uh, because I had just read the summary of the book, I could answer in the comments in a way uh, a bit snarkily. No, he's not part of the landed gentry. He's a Russian prince. <laughs> So uh, that's the story. It's the story of a girl who is uh, who lives a bit secluded in Ireland. Her parents are extremely selfish. They don't really notice her. Uh, her mother doesn't want to be eclipsed by anyone. So she, the mother goes to London for the season every year, but she doesn't take her daughter with her. Uh, one day she receives a letter from, uh, the mother receives a letter from a friend who is Princess Kirov from Russia. And she invites the daughter to be her companion for a few months in St. Petersburg. So the girl goes there and then over there she's very popular and she sorts of finds her way into society so when she comes back to London she's the toast of the town and of course uh, following her is the Russian prince Prince Kirov who is uh, the son of the princess and is uh, very much uh, enraptured by uh, this lovely young lady from Ireland with uh, of course there's a bit of um there's a bit of a stereotype there because the girl has flaming red hair and I, in Russia that was standing out a lot. However, in Ireland, she, she was just, just one more red hair among many others. Um, so anyway, it, it was absolutely lovely. I enjoyed this romance very much. It was a lot of fun. So that's that. Um, so that's it for this recent read. That's what I've read recently. Uh, what's going to come later? Um, so there are still like... 10 days and more in March. I still have time to read something Irish. Well, I guess the, the, the beginning of a Magnificent Match was in Ireland, was set in Ireland, but <laughs> I don't think it counts for the Irish readathon. And same thing for the Brother Cat File. A part of it is set in Wales, but I don't think it counts for the Wales Welsh readathon, for the Dewithon. Uh, so I'm not going to count that as the, the, the readathon being ticked like. I'm, I'm not going, I, I'm saying it doesn't count. Um, so, so, so there's still time for, for me to read something that fits the readathons. Uh, same thing for her story a thon, I still have time. Um, will I do that? I don't know. Um, I have announced my own readathon coming up in April, People April, about um, reading biographies and memoirs and nonfiction about people. And I've already borrowed so many books from the library, memoirs and biographies. I want to start right now. <laughs> so I, I think I'm not going to wait for April. I'm going to start reading books for my own readathon in advance. Uh, well, I guess that, that that's going to, to per allow me to give you suggestions eventually. So anyway, um, so that's the reason why I don't think I'm going to complete half the things I wanted to do in, in March, because I, I want April to start right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the situation. So um, anyway, 
that's it so uh, let me know in the comments or how is your reading going on in march are you doing what you plan to do or are you just improvising like i like i end up doing all the time every time um and what sort of good books have you read in march so uh thank you everyone for watching and i will see you in the next video à la prochaine